हसतो मा सत्कमया तमसो मा ज्योतिर्गमया मृत्योर्मा अमृत गमया आविरावीर्मे थी रुद्रय ते दक्षिण मुखम तेन मि नि मे द डिवाइन लीडर्स फ्रॉम दि अनियल टू द रियल फ्रॉम डार्कनेस टू लाइट फ्रॉम डेथ टू ए मोर्टैलिटी विद द डिवाइन कॉन्शियसनेस फिल अवर हार्ट्स एंड प्रोटेक्टर्स वसुदेवसुत देव कंसचाणूरमर्दनम देवकी परमानंदम कृष्ण वंदे जगद्गु वेन वी इन अवर मेडिटेशन समाइम वी यूजली बिगिन विथ पेयिंग अटेंशन टू आर ब्रेथ it's a very helpful practice it's a very good practice to begin not just the meditation but any activity is bringing attention to our breath because breathing is something that we have all been doing from the time we were born that's why we are that's the sign of life right but we get so busy with things busy with life busy with things to do that we are still living we are alive but we don't even know we are breathing and not feeling that we are breathing in in a sense is a good thing it means that we are healthy enough that breathing is not drawing attention because there are people there are situations in life and breathing become difficult so they they don't forget that they are breathing but when we we don't dwell on it so much which is in a way good but now and then it is helpful to just be at your seat wherever you are sitting and just bring attention just to remind myself that i am breathing and that reminder is important and now that we have just recovering from this or almost recovered you could say uh from the pandemic we know how people who had this especially in the initial stages the severe covid infection they had difficulty in breathing they had to be put on ventilators and all That's of that kind of and there are medical conditions which make it difficult so if we are able to kind of, whether it's a physical illness well, or an illness at a subtler level that comes then and to be we aware won't of be that. able to not physically breathe well but not able to see things clearly life can be so and that's where arjuna is that we saw how in spite of having fought many battles he this particular battle that he came to on kurukshetra he suddenly overcome with the idea oh here are these my people and how can i fight them and he says i'm not going to fight and in the earlier story of the mahabharata we know that this was not you cannot strictly say this is the first time he was fighting his own people because there are situations in mahabharata where he has had fought many battles and on the other side there were people who could be called his own people they were not all total strangers and now so this time again it's there are people and in some way this is a little bit special because not only are some of his close or near relatives on the other side but people whom he adores people whom he worships like bhishma drona his teacher his grandfather um and so this is a little special but he still this is not the first time arjuna was fighting and i mention this because again when i said in the earlier we cannot take life for granted just because we have been able to handle a certain situation in the past not be too confident that oh i have handled it i know how to do it even if it happens again i can do it it's possible i may have done this before but i may not be able to do it if my frame of mind at that time 
inexplicably gets covered by one reason or another. We know, for instance, even in, in the medical field, oftentimes surgeons don't generally try to do a major surgery if the patient is a close relative. Because again, they may be experts, they may have done hundreds of surgeries of that kind, but their objectiveness can get clouded because attachment, knowing that, oh, this person is someone, is what Arjuna says is Swajana, my own person. So that is where the situation is. And it's not simply something that happened to Arjuna. We can see that happening in our own lives, that whatever values and principles we may want to live by, most of us succeed in doing it most of the time. But sometimes such situations come in our lives when our own values, principles get challenged, so to speak, because it would mean, especially when we are dealing with a close friend or a member of the family, that should I hold on to my principles and hurt their feelings? Or should I honor them feelings, see that they are my people and relax my principles? It may not seem as dire a situation as on the battlefield, but these kind of minor or major battles are occurring in our lives all the time. And so it's important that to recognize no matter how brave Arjuna was, at this particular instant, somehow, some weakness came over him. And so he says, I'm not going to fight. And then, of course, we saw the two verses last week when Krishna says those two, in those verses, pretty strongly worded. It's almost humiliating. He just... If we didn't know who Krishna was, some of us might just say, that's not the right way to deal with someone who is in such a dire state, someone who is confused, someone who is dejected, someone who is grieving at this difficult situation. One would normally think, would say, give some words of consolation, say some something, something comforting. But Krishna uh, does something very contrary to what we might expect. He says words which are, it's almost like sometimes when people are sometimes just blabbering something, or they're not in their senses. Either you can try to calm them down well, or sometimes you might just have to go in kind of a shock treatment. Kind of, sometimes you can just go and I'm not saying you should do it. But sometimes people have gone and kind of done something, even give a physically give them a rap or something, or even say something to kind of shake them out of their stupor. So that is something that Krishna did in those verses second and third of the second chapter. And we can see that it seems to have some effect. So let's look at verse number four. Arjuna Vacha Katham Bhishma Maham Sankhe Dronan Jamadu Sudana Ishubhiv Pratiyot Syami Pujar Hauvari Sudana Arjuna said, But how can I, in battle, O slayer of Madhu, fight with arrows against Bhishma and Drona, who are rather worthy to be worshipped or destroyer of foes? So it begins with but. So what it shows is a little bit of change has occurred. In the first chapter when he was arguing, I won't fight, he was saying, oh, to fight against these people, these are all my people, I won't do it. Now he's only singling out Bhishma and Drona, meaning that, okay, I think it's not, it won't be wrong to go and kill Duryodhana of the kind of really villainish people on the other side. But still there is this hesitation. But still, how can I go and send arrows against Bhishma and Drona? 
पूजा आर हाउ दे आर वर्दी ऑफ वर्शिप दैट दे एंड देर इज नो डाउट दे वर वर्चुअस पीपल अकॉर्डिंग टू सम परसेप्शन दे वर ऑल्सो एनलाइटन बट देन दे हैड देयर ओन कंपल्शन सो दे फाउंड देम सेल्स अगेन हियर वी आर सींग एवरीथिंग ओनली फ्रॉम अ द प्रॉब्लम ऑफ अर्जुना बट रियली लॉट ऑफ पीपल ऑन दैट बैटल फील्ड वर अंडर गोइंग सिमिलर कॉन्फ्लिक्ट ऑफ इंटरेस्ट इंक्लूडिंग भीष्म एंड द्रोणा दे न्यू वट वॉज राइट दे न्यू दे वर ऑन द रॉन्ग साइड दे न्यू दैट दे हैड चॉइसिस टू मेक and they all have made choices they all had their justifications for doing what they did now we have the advantage of hindsight so to speak because we don't know because a lot of times we they have to take decisions on the spur of the moment and we take decision believing that's the right thing but then maybe a day later or a week later when you look back and say oh probably i shouldn't have done that i should have chosen something else so all of these people were making choices bishwa and drona made a choice and to them it seemed that that was the right choice then and then of course we when we look at these incidents which occurred obviously centuries ago we then can have our own judgment whether or oh, this was the right thing to do or wrong thing to do but everyone on the battlefield had come to their own personal decisions and deciding to be whether on this side or on the other side and so arjuna's dilemma is clear that these are my own people how can i fight and not now saying in generic way he is specifically pointing out bhishma and drona verse 5 guru na hatva hi mahanubhavan श्रेयो भोक्त भैक्षमी हलोके हथ काम स्तु गुरु निहव भुंजीय भोगान्धिर प्रदिधा श्योली इट वुड बी बेटर इवन टू ईट द ब्रेड ऑफ बैगरी इन दिस लाइफ दैन टू स्ले दीज ग्रेट सोल्ड मास्टर्स बट इफ आई किल दैम इवन इन दिस वर्ल्ड ऑल माई एन्जॉयमेंट ऑफ वेल्थ एंड डिजायर्स will be stained with blood see in the two verses earlier in verse 2 and 3 when krishna kind of gave a scolding to arjuna one of the f- words he uses is aswargyam that is whatever you are doing is not something that will take you to heaven and so what arjuna is really saying is is not even thinking of heaven he said right now right here how can i be happy either i mean it's a it's a difficult choice i have to kill these people who i respect who i love but after killing them how can i enjoy the victory because my victory will be it's like my hands will be stained with their blood i cannot even rejoice at my victory and so the dilemma of before him is not whether he'll win or lose he was confident he would have won the war that's that's not a problem the problem is what should he do should he kill these people and then not really have his hands stained with blood and not even enjoy that victory the victory would be meaningless or should he say withdraw from the battle and not not do something which he feels is wrong one thing is clear that the he uses the word mahanubhavan the great soul ones here in this guru na hatvahi mahanubhavan mahanubhava means maha maha these great great soul people really people who are really good and so the question is who is the fight between who are the parties that are being fought here arjuna is seeing it here as i am going to i am going being asked to kill these really good honorable people whom i love and adore 
But is the fight between Arjuna and these great soul ones, or is the fight between dharma, that which is right on one side, and then the error, that which is adharma on the other side? And so, think about it this way. <coughs> I, I spoke earlier about surgery. What would a, a surgeon's duty be? Now, correctly, honestly, if most surgeries will involve cutting, and if you cut the body, there is going to be blood. There is going to be pain. Of course, they'll give you anesthesia and painkillers and all of that. But still, anyone who has had any kind of surgery know that ultimately, after the healing is over and, and rehabilitation and all of that, it's good. We, 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 we are cured of whatever problem there was. But the process itself is quite painful. Now, what if suddenly a surgeon who has done many surgeries and knows that it is the surgeon is skilled in doing that, suddenly says, oh, I can't see this blood. It's going to be so painful to these people. And so I can't do it. I can't bring in pain. It's like himsa. I believe in non-violence. I won't do it. Now, that would be a ridiculous argument. But, but literally, it's true. You are cutting open a body. Blood is going to come out. There is going to be pain. There is going to be suffering. But the intent behind that suffering is really to cure, to help the person. So everything that Arjuna said in the first chapter is true. No war is pretty. So if we have a choice between violence and non-violence, of course we choose non-violent. That's kind of, that's obvious. But what if the choice is only between less violence and more violence? Then less violence is a better choice because, because there is no other, the only other option is more violence. And so that is the situation here. That yes, it's painful. Yes, it might involve killing the people I love and adore. But that is necessary for a larger curing of the body politic, of a larger, not only for that period, but also for the next generation. So just like in a surgery, a little bit of pain and suffering and loss of blood is accepted as necessary for a larger cure, exactly in the same way it is necessary here. But that's some, now his mind has gotten clouded. Therefore, he is not seeing. It's not like our mind is completely clear, so we are seeing it. We are seeing it because all these great scholars and commentators have commented on it. So let's not immediately assume, oh, this was so obvious, we can see it, why couldn't Arjuna see it? Because, you see, it, this is still, we are looking at it very objectively. But when difficult situations come in our own life, it's not so easy to be that objective and neutral. That time our emotions, feelings, attachments, everything comes in. And, and then it's, it's not so easy then to determine what is the right course of action. Verse 6. Na chaitat vidmaf katarano gariyo yadva jayema yadivano jayeyuhu yane vahatva na jiji vishamaha devas thita pramukhe dhartarashtraha. And indeed, I can scarcely tell which will be better, that we should conquer them or they should conquer us. The very sons of Dhritarashtra, after slaying whom we should not care to live, stand facing us. So that's the dilemma here. Whether we should kill them or they should kill us. And he is now so confused, so wondering what, what is the right thing. He says, I don't know which of these is better. Verse 7. Karpanya dosho apahataswabhavaha pricha mitvam dharma sammudha chetaha yashre yasyan nishchitam bruhitanme 
ಶಿಷ್ಯಸ್ತೇಹಂ ಶಾಧಿಮಾಂ ತ್ವಾಂ ಪ್ರಪನ್ನ ವಿತ್ ಮೈ ನೇಚರ್ ಓವರ್ ಫಾರ್ಡ್ ಬೈ ವಿ ಕಮಿಸರೇಷನ್ ವಿತ್ ಅ ಮೈಂಡ್ ಇನ್ ಕನ್ಫ್ಯೂಷನ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಡ್ಯೂಟಿ ಐ ಸಪ್ಲಿಕೇಟ್ ದಿ ಸೇ ಡಿಸೈಡೆಡ್ಲಿ ವಾಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಗುಡ್ ಫಾರ್ ಮೀ ಐ ಎಮ್ ದೈ ಡಿಸೈಪಲ್ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟ್ರಕ್ಟ್ ಮೀ ಹು ಹ್ ಟೇಕನ್ ರೆಫ್ಯೂಜ್ ಇನ್ ದಿ ಫೈನಲಿ ಆಫ್ಟರ್ ದಿಸ್ ಕೈಂಡ್ ಆಫ್ argument and saying what he feels this is the kind of a turning point in in arjuna's life so what he is really saying is he recognizes the word karpanya it's a sanskrit troop is is krip and it means um something to be pitied or deserving of mercy and so what Arjuna is saying is, at present, Swabhavaha, Swabhava, Swabhava, Swa is self, Bhava is nature. So Swabhava is my nature. So overpowered by this Karpanya, that my situation has become oh, like I am someone worthy of being pitied. That's a, I'm in a very pitiable state with a mind that in confusion about duty we have seen the confusion should i fight should i not fight what happens if i fight what happens if i do not fight and both the sides it's not it's not a win win situation as arjuna sees it it's a lose lose situation for him and so he doesn't know what to do and so he, so this is an important phrase swabhava my swabhava my nature has been clouded and and that's why as we will see when krishna begins his teaching his teaching begins with the idea of the self because if my nature my true nature the nature of the self if it is not clouded then i will know exactly what should be done when and how but we know in our lives on a daily basis we are called upon to take decisions small decisions big decisions and how we decide to do whatever it is that we decide to do is based on how how i see myself on my self identity so if a child goes to his father or mother and says mom dad i want this then what uh, when how will a father or mother respond to that at that time when one's own child is asking for something the identity of the other person is i am the father i am the mother so as my nature then as a father how i should respond to this request or a demand from my child and then we know there are the different relationships in life it's not just father and child it could be many different ways we are related to one another so every time we are relating to others that particular identity with which we are related to that person or to that work or to that place or to that situation that comes on the uppermost and then we respond accordingly which will then come later on we will see what are these different identities among the different identities i juggle in my life is there any identity that i have that is permanent because we know a lot of our identities are time bound clearly our human identity we don't know what we were before we were born but we know because when we were born we found ourselves in a human body now we have a human identity i am a human being now when i die this body is going to be either cremated or buried the body is not going to be a part of who i am so am i still a human being after death what is my identity then so some of our identities are based on on our interests so 
if I'm a fan of the Red Sox, I would say I'm a Sox fan. So that's an identity, but but it can change. Maybe I move to New York and then become a fan of Yankees, which would I will never be able to come back to Boston then if I do that. But again, these identities will change based on our interest. Or uh, if someone is a, a citizen or a nationality of a particular country, and this person then moves to a different part of the world, then that identity will change. So some identities change with place, some identity change with time. So do we just have all of these identities just forever changing? Or do I have any permanent identity of my own, which will never change? And so that's how then the teaching will begin with that question about identity. Because this is the problem with Arjuna, that his nature, his present identity he has as a cousin of these people, as a grandson of these, as a student of Drona, all these identities are clouded his judgment about what his Swadharma. Swadharma means what my duty is. Dharma is also understood in terms of duty. So we see the word, there's so many words that come in the Gita with the prefix swa, mine. So we saw Arjuna first saying swajana, these are my people. Now he's saying my swabhava, my nature is clouded. And then the idea will come, what is my swadharma? In this particular situation, what is my duty? So my people, my nature, my duty. What is this my? Who is this I? Krishna, being the best among the teachers, is clearly able to see the problem is not with what he should do or what he shouldn't do. The problem is with the I. And that's why he'll begin the teaching with that I. So dharma sammudha chetaha, dharma, as I said, is also understood as duty. So I'm confused about what is my duty at this point. Yat shreyasyat nishchitam bruhitan me. In the, in the Kathopanishad, there are these two terms that are often presented, Shreyas and Preyas. And they're translated in different ways. One way to understand them, Shreyas means that which is true, that which is good, that which is true. Preyas means that which is pleasant. And so the Upanishad says that there are times in our life when these two options come before us. Now this, this is a little bit tricky because when, you're, when you give a choice between the good versus the pleasant, this is not meant to say that, well, if it is good, then it's always going to be unpleasant. That's not clearly the idea. But sometimes what is good may not be immediately attractive. And what is immediately attractive may not be good. And so when these choices come before us, and that's, that's the dilemma that sometimes comes before us sometimes. Sometimes there is some particular, for instance, if someone's sugar level is high and, the, and we are told, don't eat sweets. But if this person then loves sweets, and so sweets come before you, and so you say, oh, that's attractive, that's pleasant. I would love to do that. On the other hand, for my own good, for my own Shreya, I shouldn't do it. And so that could be a dilemma. And so the Upanishad then says that a person with some discernment, Viveka, then would observe the pros and cons. Whenever, And that's a good practice. Whenever we have choices to make, to not just reflexively just jump into something. Because if you're lucky, we might make the right choice. But if we make a wrong choice, then we'll just have nothing but regret later. So it's good to, especially if you're taking very important decisions in life, to just pause a little bit. Whatever decision we take, to take it calmly after weighing all the pros and cons. In fact, the Upanishad says, one kind of goes around observing it from all angles and then deciding. 
And of course, the Upanishad, as you can imagine, would recommend that we always choose that which is good over that which is merely pleasant. And the same word is used here. Yat shreyasyat. So what Arjuna is asking Krishna here is not something, just tell me what's the attractive option. He's saying, tell me an option. What is Shreya? What is good for me? In other words, I'm willing to do what you say, even if it doesn't seem attractive right away. Nishchitam bruhitan me. Nishchitam, tell me firmly, conclusively. Because he is confused now. And he needs some help from someone who can give some instruction with confidence. Shishya steham, accept me as your shishya, as your student. Shadhi maam tvam prapannam. Shadhi maam means teach me. Prapannam, I surrender to you. There are very important things here. In, in many of the Upanishads, we find that the student has to make a, a, a verbal proclamation, so to speak, to say clearly, I want to be your student and teach me. And oftentimes the, the formal teaching begins only when we make that. Now sometimes when you enroll in school, enroll in a course, the fact that you have chosen to enroll in that course is a way of saying, I want to be a student for that. So nowadays, of course, if you, I mean, the way the system is set up, you don't necessarily go to every professor and say, accept me as your student. Sometimes we can just do it online now. But this was a pre-internet days. And so there was nothing <laughs> Arjuna could do online. So Arjuna tells him clearly, accept me. Now, being a student doesn't simply mean, it's, it's a, it's a big commitment. It's not simply saying, okay, accept me as a student, then you can give me, and then I'll decide what to do about it. That was not the, the here, the, being a student means I trust your judgment. That there is an element of, I don't know to use the word faith, because faith is a word that is so used enough anywhere and everywhere, that it lacks the force. There is a Sanskrit word called Shraddha. Shraddha is, it kind of looks like faith, but unlike faith, we know that, I mean, although generally the word faith is used, unfortunately, to even refer to religious traditions. Oh, so many, multi-faith, interfaith. Uh, not wrong, but to kind of restrict the idea of faith only to the field of religion, it seems to ignore how pervasive faith is in daily life, even in a non-religious sphere, so to speak. For instance, and as I've often pointed out, we take public transport or you take an Uber. You have no idea who the driver is or who your pilot is on the flying. You just have faith that they are just going to be careful and alert. You go to a restaurant, you have no idea who has cooked your food and put it in front of you. We just do it with faith that this is not, this is not, this is going to be something I'm going to enjoy and, and it's going to not create any upset inside. Or people make investments, again, with faith that is going to provide good returns. So much of our life is based on faith. We like to think that we are very logical, rational, reason, applying reason everywhere, but that's not the case. Life would be impossible without faith. But all of this faith that we have can sometimes get shaken. People sometimes lose faith. If, if they have a bad experience, especially a traumatic one, then they say, well, I no longer have faith in that. But there is this something else which looks like faith, but it once it comes, it's never shaken. It never is lost. And the Sanskrit word for that is Shraddha. We find that in the beginning of the same Upanishad I referred to earlier, Kathopanishad, 
In the very beginning, the text says, Shraddha Avivesha. This young boy called Nachiketa, Shraddha entered into him. And then we see, once the Shraddha enters into him, that deep faith, if you like, if you want to give a, call it, looks like faith, so let's call it deep faith. It's something like, I would think, I would call it, it's a kind of a, it's not a feeling, it's not intellectual, but it's something deep down in the, it's kind of in the gut, so to speak, to say, yes, this is true. And one may not have had any experience about it. One may not have any evidence to prove it. So it's not intellectual, it's not just a feeling. But deep down somehow you feel it's true. You may not be able to prove it to anyone, but you know it's true. So that is Shraddha. That Shraddha entered into Nachiketa, we read in the Upanishad. And so many temptations were offered to him and he was able to not get distracted by any of them because of that Shraddha. And by the end of the teaching, we see that his all his ignorance had disappeared and he became enlightened. So Shraddha, this deep faith, is considered absolutely and requirement if we have to advance in spiritual life. So here, Shishya Steham, here is a way of saying, although the word Shraddha is not used, it will come later in the Gita, that I have trust, I have Shraddha in your teaching. I surrender myself, Prapannam. Prapannam means I surrender myself to you. In fact, later on the Gita will point out Shraddhavan Labhate Jnanam. Only a person with Shraddha will get that highest knowledge. There is another place Shraddha comes in the Gita later on when Krishna says, Yoya Shraddha Sayeva Saha, the measure of a person, who a human being is, how the worth of a human being from a spiritual standpoint depends on how much Shraddha the person has. So Shraddha is, is, a, is a vital necessity in spiritual life. So this is the kind of a statement Arjuna is making here. That Shishya Steham, accept me as a student, please teach me, I am confused and I am surrendering myself to you. And the surrender here means I will not allow my ego to get in the way that I will accept whatever you tell me even if it doesn't make sense to me immediately. That's, the, that's what Shraddha means. Verse 8. Nahi prapashyami mama punadhyat yacho ka mucho shanam indriyanam avapya bhuma va sapatnam riddham rajyam surana mapichadhi patyam I do not see anything to remove this sorrow which blasts my senses, even were I to obtain unrivaled and flourishing domaining, dominion, dominion over the earth and mastery over the gods. So again, he's just saying what his situation is and why he's surrendering to Krishna. Sanjayu Vacha. Eva Muktva Rishi Kesham Guda Keshav Parantapa Nayotsya Itigo Vindam Uktva Tushneem Babhuvaha Sanjaya said, Having spoken thus to the Lord of the senses, Gudakesha, the scorcher of foes, said to Govinda, I shall not fight, and became silent. So this is clear, but it's also interesting, as I mentioned earlier, although we know the dialogue is between Krishna and Arjuna, sometimes Rather than just saying, this is what Arjuna said to Krishna, um, throughout the Gita we'll find a different epithets, a different way of referring to Krishna, a different way of referring to Arjuna. And sometimes these are very significant of why Arjuna was referred to this way, why Krishna was referred to this way. Remember, this is a narration that Sanjaya is doing to Dhritarashtra, the blind king. So when he tells him, this is what happened, 
just at, before the beginning of the battle. And so all this he narrates to Dhritarashtra. And then he says, finally, Arjuna said, Na yod say, I shall not fight. Now, Dhritarashtra, as most of the people on that battlefield, knew that the Pandavas were invincible. So there was a hope that they would win, but, but everyone knew that Pandavas will win. And so once, and so Dhritarashtra himself, the blind king knew he would, of course, wanted his own children to win, but he knew that Krishna is on the other side. So, so it was kind of a foregone conclusion in his mind. No one was saying it aloud, but, but so there was the hope on one side and there was the sane part of the mind saying, no, there is no hope. So now when Arjuna tells Dhritarashtra, sorry, Sanjaya tells Dhritarashtra that Arjuna said, I'm not going to fight. Dhritarashtra's face suddenly lights up. Remember, he doesn't know what is happening there. This is the way, this is the first time he's hearing what's happening in the battlefield. We know what happened afterwards. Dhritarashtra still doesn't know. So when he hears, oh, Arjuna said he's not going to fight, he's just happy. There is some hope that there won't be war and my children will be saved. And that's why he is using these epithets here. He refers to Krishna as Lord of the senses. So don't forget, on the other side is Krishna, who is, who is invincible, and refers to Arjuna as the scorcher of the foes, Gudakesha. So don't, this is just the beginning. The war hasn't ended. So keep that in mind. And that's why these epithets are used for Krishna and Arjuna and became silent. Tushnim Babhuva, verse 10. Tamuvacha Rishi Keshaha Prahasan Niva Bharata Senayor Ubayor Madhye Vishi Danta Midam Vachaha To him who, has, who was sorrowing in the midst of the two armies, Rishi Kesha, as if smiling, or descendant of Bharata, spoke these words. So again, we see Krishna smiling in Swami Vivekananda's works. He gives a beautiful kind of a word picture, a description about this, how in the middle of the battlefield, the conches have been blown, the horses are raring to go, everyone is charged up. And here is this Arjuna, just dejected and saying, I won't fight. And here is this Krishna with this how many horses were there? Four, five, five horses? I don't remember now. Uh, the chariot which Arjuna was riding on. So he's holding it one hand. He's holding the reins of these four or five horses who were raring to go. And seeing this Arjuna here in a dejected condition and teaching him this highest philosophy. And all the time being completely calm and with a smile, Prahasan Iva is with a smile on his face. And then the next verse 11 is when Krishna's teaching begins. In fact, many of the traditional commentaries on, on the Gita really begin with the, this verse. So as far as the teaching itself goes, the, the Gita as a teaching really begins with the 11th verse of the second chapter. And all of this Shankaracharya in his commentary points out that the situation of Arjuna mentioned up to this point shows how every one of us, we have our identity, but this our true identity, our real identity has gotten covered, has gotten clouded with all these numerous connections we have made in this objective world. The material world in which we exist, the people, the animals, nature, 
all of these have become a part of my life. And to the extent they are a part of my life, to the extent I'm related to all of this, it has added on to my own identity. It has added on to my nature. And so the way we react in the world, the way we do things is based upon how my present identity is and what the nature of my relationships is, the nature of my own understanding of what my duties, my responsibilities in life are. And if my understanding of myself is not clear, it's not transparent, then everything I do, everything, every decision I take will be as clouded as my understanding of the self. So one of the first things to be kept in mind here is that very few people really think that it's an identity crisis. So before we discover our inner identity, there has to be some kind of an identity crisis. And majority of people take life for granted. No, I mean, how many people have you seen, even among your own circles, questioning, Is, I'm, am I really a human being? Is that really my identity? If you don't go and ask, bringing that question up to your friends, they will think something is wrong with you. Because most people take life for granted. They said, this is the world. This is who I am. These are the things. This is what I'm supposed to do. Because that's what everyone is doing. So people just take things for granted. And so those people actually apparently may not have any conflict of the kind that Arjuna has. They, yes, there are, there are, of course, difficulties and challenges we have. But very few of those challenges are directly related to our identity. And so this is an imp important thing, that if... If there is a problem, how do I address a problem? Because a lot of times a problem can have a visible um, symptoms. And for instance, again, I'm I'm not a medical person, so if I'm if I'm saying something which doesn't make complete sense, just ignore it. But but think about it this way. When there is pain in the body. And in, in the last 40 or 50 years, there has been a lot more attention given, even in the medical field, on pain, pain management. And it wasn't so much, even until the 60s or 70s, that's what I read one place, that pain didn't receive as much attention earlier as it does now. But one way of looking at pain is a pain is a pain itself is not an illness or a disease. But pain is an indication that something is wrong. So pain actually is a great blessing in some ways. Because there is a there is a, a, a disorder, a physical disorder, where people don't feel pain at all. And one someone might think, oh, that's so wonderful, you're never going to be painful. But actually that's extremely dangerous. So if I go and stub my toe, I wouldn't even know it until somebody notices blood coming out. So pain is a great help because it, it's a warning that something is wrong. Now, if there is pain, our natural uh, impulse is to stop the pain, to take a painkiller. And if, if the pain is due to some small little irregularity, usually the painkiller will numb the pain and usually we just become all right on our own. But sometimes the pain may not be something that can be just maybe an indication of some disorder inside for which merely a painkiller may not be enough. And so I mentioned all this because not because it's, a, you know, I said I don't know much about medicine myself. But whenever there is a problem in life, that problem will have some external manifestation. If we deal only with symptoms, and not go to the root of the problem, that problem 
may seem to have gone for a while but can reappear again. So the best of the teachers will not merely cure the symptom but will actually go to the root of the problem. Because only when you remove it from the root, there is no chance of it appearing again. And Krishna here, being the highest among the teachers, has seen through what Arjuna's problem is. And rather than telling him, oh, don't worry, it's fine. That's what sometimes modern therapists might want to do. But Krishna, is, 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 his approach is different, as we will see. So we will stop here today. When we meet next week, we can begin with Krishna's teaching. But, but if you have any comments or ideas up to what we have seen today, feel free to share. Swamiji, to uncover our true identity, can we simply remove the layers above the clouds or do we have to add something? Do we have to add a divine identity? No, the, clouds, cl the cloud itself is the layer. And we don't have to add anything. We, in fact, all the additions have to go, then, then I as I am will remain. I just have more of a technical question. I noticed that uh, in some verses, the meter changes mm -hmm. um, and the way that the, the verses are chanted changes. Mm -hmm. does, that, does that have any particular meaning or is it to accommodate the, the, the phrasing no. or something? Or? I don't know. I don't know why. All, but okay. yeah, there are a few verses when the meter does change. Most of the verses are in a meter, they call it in Sanskrit, Anushtup meter. But there are these few verses where it's a little different. And so I've heard it being chanted like that. So my, just by that habit, I do it. Yeah. Swamiji, my question is about Shraddha. Um, so some, and maybe it's just the translation that's throwing me off because sometimes I find that people who have really deep faith or deep Shraddha, they're also really close-minded sometimes about things. And so, and maybe I'm missing some context. So how do we think about that? Or what, what is the right way to think about that Shraddha? So that, for example, like you don't want to believe just one, the one God that you believe in is the only God. Like there are infinite variations. Of, so how do we think about that? I think Shraddha to know objectively is difficult. That oh, this person has Shraddha or this person doesn't have. It's something, it's very subjective. It's completely inside. And the dividing line between like ordinary faith and Shraddha is, is very difficult to determine. And so I wouldn't, I wouldn't call, I would think that Shraddha in the truest sense of the term can be applied only when it is referring to that which is an unchanging reality or truth. Because Shraddha, as I said, the way it's described in books, once it comes, actually, when I, I'm using the word it comes, because that's what the Upanishad also says, but it's not something that's like coming from outside. Shraddha is, in fact, in the, we just had the Durga Puja in the Chandi or the Durga Saptashati. There is this one verse which says, Ya Devi Sarva Bhuteshu Shraddha Rupena Samsthita Namastasyai 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 Namo Namaha. So Shraddha is actually come straight from the divine. It's the Devi, it's the power of the divine. It's a mysterious, tremendous power which is already in our heart. It's not, it's not an emotion or a feeling or, or even intellectual anything. It's a power. Now that power is kind of submerged, it's covered. And so when this covering goes away, then that Shraddha which is already inside manifests. Now that Shraddha, unlike other just kind of a faith, it is never shaken. It never goes away. So if someone has Shraddha, then it has to be truly unwavering. And I would think, again, I, I would find it very difficult to think that someone who's, in whose heart Shraddha has entered would be something which will have all these negative things. It will be difficult to match the two together. Swamiji, Gita uh, is, is just war between Pandava and uh, Kaurava, which you were reading, yeah. So Lord Krishna knew 
this is all material and it's not going to be matter, still he was teaching Arjuna to fight over. Why? Fight? Fight over a material things, which hmm. is, Lord Krishna no, knew it. No, Krishna was simply was saying, do your duty. If you do your duty selflessly, then your own nature will become clear to you. Right now, you are a warrior, your identity is that of a Kshatriya, and your duty is now is to fight. Now, if you do that in a selfless way, that's why the teaching of Karma Yoga will come. So if you fight this, not because oh, these are my people, and I, I, if I win, then I can't enjoy my victory. It's not, for, it's not about you are enjoying the victory or rejoicing at the victory. It's not about rejoicement, it's just about carrying out your duty. And if you do that, then your own nature will become clear to you. So that's all that Krishna is saying here. That, and this applies to all of us, that wherever we are, in every situation, we just have to identify what my duty is in this situation. And if I carry out that duty selflessly in a spirit of yoga, then instead of that duty binding me, because we know sometimes we work and then that work, we get so consumed by our work, it exhausts us, we get tied up, we, it just, we just get exhausted and it creates a lot of stress and anxiety. Now what Krishna is saying is, carry out your duties, don't shirk your work. But if you do that work as a yoga, then instead of increasing your stress and anxiety, in fact, it will remove it. Instead of you getting caught up in it and bound in it, in fact, it will become a way towards your freedom. So that's all Krishna's teaching here is, basically. But you still come for the Gita class. I'm just I'm saying that's all, as if in a <laughs> one sentence I'm going to finish it off. But the point is simply this. Know who, we, who you are. And again, yes, in the book we read, oh, you are the infinite spirit and all of that. That's fine. But that's not something we remember every moment of our life. Eventually it will happen when all the other, the clouds will go away. But right now, whatever our identity is, that's fine. It's, it's not a sin to think of yourself as a human being or as this or that. That's fine. But whichever way we see ourselves, based on that identity, whatever duties and responsibilities come to me, I have to do them because that's, that's how I'm identified with it. But if I do those duties and responsibilities, carry them out as a yoga, then rather than me getting sucked into this samsara, it will in fact free me. And if it frees me, then more and more my swabhava, my true nature will become clear. So that's, that's the idea here. Yeah, uh, Pranam Swamiji. Uh, <clears throat> just from a daily, you know, practical, what do we need to do? Um, could it be said that our confusion and identity is coming from the fact that we have all the mental impressions that are saying, I did this, I did that, past us. So, so we're trying to clear the stack and then hopefully not keep adding to it every day. So we get, keep getting buried. Absolutely. Yeah. And the other thing is, even though the you know Bhishma and Pitama and, and uh, Dronacharya, they knew they were on this side, I, is it maybe that they were also suggesting this notion of prarabdha or destiny? It's if you do it with dispassion. I mean, okay, they know they were on the other side, but is there an element of that in there also that they had to face this because this was their destiny and to exhaust it, <clears throat> you have to go through it? Yeah, I mean, good. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's difficult to kind of pass a judgment on these things retrospectively. We don't know whether Bhishma and Drona, if they were on the other side, maybe the war itself wouldn't have occurred because the whole main strength of these people over Bhishma. So all that we can say is this is the way things happen. Everyone made their own call and this is what happened. Yeah, we wouldn't, we, it, it wouldn't help to know what, what if situation. Yeah. Pram Swamiji. Uh, so uh, the thought that comes to my mind, Swamiji, is uh, in verse 7, um, 
Arjuna basically says, uh, I'm, com I'm, I'm confused, I'm mm. perplexed, and I'm going to take refuge in you. You tell me what is right. Mm -hmm. So hypothetically, if that had not happened, so in other words, Krishna's teachings become possible because Arjuna realizes that there is no other way. This is the only way, and he has the humility to admit that I don't know. So uh, taking that situation in our secular life, this is about spirituality. And I know Gita is applicable in secular life as well, but I try to relate to situations with our complex situations every day where there isn't a clear answer. You know, do what is right, what makes you stronger is the right thing to do, as Swamiji said. That's easy to say, Swamiji, but there are so many complex situations. So my, my question is, where is my Krishna at that time when I am trying to figure out a solution to a secular problem? And how do I have the humility to say that I don't know the answer right now? I need to figure out what, what is your the right Krishna way. Your Krishna is in your heart. <laughs> yeah. And that's why, that's why when we are asked, when we pray or when we are asked to meditate, we meditate in the heart. Because, again, the historical Krishna and the historical Arjuna were there several centuries ago. But for not a moment should any of us think that these great ones have just gone. They never go. Whether it's Krishna, Rama, Jesus, Buddha, Shankara, Ramakrishna. <coughs> yes, historically, we are separated from them in time. But they are very much present. And so, again, with a heart filled with that Shraddha, if we pray, if we meditate, we can feel their presence right inside. In fact, at least for Arjuna, Krishna was standing maybe two feet away on the chariot. Actually, Krishna is even closer to us. It's, it's right inside, not even, not, not far at all. There is in the Quran, there is a statement to the effect that God is closer to us than our jugular vein, apparently this one vein, which is kind of the life blood apparently goes from there. A lot of times if people want to kill someone, they, they know exactly which place to, to slice it. So uh, they say that God is closer, Allah is closer even than this. The idea is clearly, that's, and many different traditions they point out, that no one in life, nothing in life is closer to us than the divine than God. And so, yes, Krishna is always available. Not to give some old reference, but it is become quite old now. Those of you who are Harry Potter fans, which is now seems so like, it seems like it is the last century, although it wasn't that old. So there is this one statement there. I think this comes in the probably second part or third part. When it came out new, I used to I used to read it, and I really, it it brought a lot of uh, analogies which were helpful in the topics we were studying then. But there is this one place, I think the the headmaster of that uh, Hogwarts, Hogwarts, right? School. He says that help is always available to those at Hogwarts who ask for it. Any of you remember that? And that's so true. When I read that for the first time, I said, that's exactly true in spiritual life. If we seek, and then as you pointed out, Ashish, that, that if we are truly humble, if we are able to bring that same mindset that Arjuna brings here, that yes, I'm confused, I don't know what to do. With that real humility, if we surrender to the divine, the help is always available right now. And so the problem is not about the availability of help. Help. The problem is about our getting the ego out of the way, the truly surrendering to the divine. Surrendering is not as easy as we think. It's easy to say, oh, I'm surrendering to you. But to actually do it, we know in our own lives that it needs, it needs hard work, surrendering. So we will continue this discussion when we meet next week. And as I said, we begin with Krishna's teaching 
from the verse 11 when we meet again. Om Jananim Saradam Devim Ramakrishnam Jagat Gurum Padapadme Tayo Shritva Pranamami Mohur Mohohom